Uh, I'm uh, Bob Rack. I'm the uh, coordinator of environmental science and technology at Bristol Community College. And uh, I've been here for, uh, this is my 23rd year that I've been teaching at Bristol Community College. And prior to that, you know, just don't always think that your, your career is going to be in a straight line. When I was uh, in college, I planned on being a freshwater fisheries biologist. And that's what I was studying to be. And so while I was there, I had an opportunity to do a summer job at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center in Woods Hole. And I applied for the position and I went there and I got, got the position for the summer. And I was working as a biological aide at the uh, the aquarium. I don't know if people have been down to Woods Hole, but if you go past where the the ships are to go to Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket and go all the way down the street, there's an aquarium down there. It's a free aquarium. It's put on by the National Marine Fisheries Service. And uh, Woods Hole is quite a place. So if you get to go down there, it's it's worth the trip. You, you don't, can't always see a lot of the stuff there, but uh, it's the home of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, the Marine Biological Laboratory, the uh, U.S. Geological Survey, and also the National Marine Fisheries Service. So on the East Coast, it's the, uh, the largest area for marine science uh, studies. There's also on the West Coast, you have Scripps Institute of Technology over there. And... Uh, but on the East Coast, it's uh, Woods Hole. And so I was working as a uh, biological aide. So I was going out actually collecting things for the aquarium. I'd be going out in local waters on boats and things and collecting things. And I did that actually for four summers. I did it for two summers as an undergraduate and two summers as a graduate student when I was going for my uh, master's degree in and this is where I switched after working down in, in Woods Hole I decided to go into marine biology so I was working for my master's degree in marine biology in uh, at UMass Dartmouth and so after I finished my coursework I was hired as a full-time temporary uh, working there with the resource assessments division so my major uh, area was looking at deep sea scallops so I was studying uh, all the ships that came in and out of New Bedford, collecting the, uh, cap catching scallops, what they got, where they caught it. And I also was going out on cruises up and down the Atlantic coast from Cape Hatteras up to the Bay of Fundy in Canada. And I did uh, one study with the, about 10,000 scallops that I was uh, doing a growth study on. And so I was uh, all set, and this is another thing where things happen. I was all set to be hired full time. And the day I was going to be hired full time, uh, President Ronald Reagan put a federal hiring freeze in place. And so I couldn't be hired. And uh, so in the morning, I was going to be hired. In the afternoon, I, I no longer was going to be hired. And I pretty much could stay there for a little bit of time more, but then I had to find another job. And so as I always feel, when one door closes, another door opens. And so I had uh, been on a whale watch one time. I said, gee, you know, I, sometime I'd like to do this as a job. And it just so happened when I was looking for a job that a position as a whale watch naturalist out of Plymouth opened and I applied for the job and I was hired. So I did that for a year. I was going around to schools doing uh, presentations. I gave 225 presentations that year in schools throughout Massachusetts and Rhode Island and plus going out and observing the whales in the summertime. And then I thought it was time to look for a more uh, stable type of position because I was mostly working on uh, commissions and things like that while I was out there. So I saw that they were working at the, the uh, wastewater treatment plant in Fall River and they were upgrading it. So I said, well, I'm going to go down there and uh, see what's available. So this is, you know, putting your best foot forward. I, I went down just cold. I walked in there in a three-piece suit with my uh, resume in hand. And when I walked in there, they said, oh, you must be here to see Bruce. And so I said, sure, I'll talk to Bruce. And it happened to be that they were looking for a chemist, a junior chemist in the laboratory. And so I was hired for, with Metcalf and Eddie uh, engineering uh, to work in the laboratory there. And I ended up 
shortly becoming the laboratory director down there. And I was laboratory director there for 11 and a half years. And so I worked about six years in the National Marine Fisheries Service. Then I worked uh, 11 and a half years at the uh, uh, wastewater treatment plant in Fall River. And then I took some time off to be with my uh, family. I had two young boys and uh, my wife was teaching in Taunton. She was the head of the science department in Taunton. And so I was working, uh, I, I was at home taking care of the boys. And uh, then after about six months, I got a part-time position working as a computer uh, instructor for Dominican Academy in Fall River, which was an all girls school teaching computers because I had worked with computers since I was 10 years old. My father was a data processor and a systems analyst with the Navy. And uh, so I was working computers, you know, for a long time. And so I had taught that, that for about a year and a half, then a part-time position became available at Bristol Community College as direct uh, uh, coordinator of the environmental technology program. And then I was hired as a full-time faculty member in 1997 in January of 1997. So I've been there since then teaching about water and, and wastewater. And I have my title is out of sight, but no longer out of mind. Because one of the things that we think about is people don't generally think about where their water comes from or where their water goes after you flush the toilet. You know, it, it doesn't just magically disappear. Uh, it goes places and people are working on that. And so, when we go into the uh, looking at water, you know, it's been said that water infrastructure is the lifeblood of our economy. Because for one thing, we cannot survive as an economy without clean water. And we also need it. And if we're looking at the developing the blue economy, we have to maintain the quality of the water that our blue economy is in, which is part of a wastewater treatment. And so when we're looking at the water system, you know, one of the things is we have part of public health because the, one of the greatest success stories in public health was when we uh, were, gained the ability to uh, purify water and make it safe to drink by disinfecting it to remove pathogens. Now that same water is also, the same water system is used for fire protection. Industry needs clean water. Industry isn't gonna go into an area without clean water. Agriculture uses a big portion of our water. And also generally the quality of life that we want is brought about by water treatment plant operators who are out there, if we think about it, they're out there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, you know, 365 days a year. So if anybody's brushed their teeth, washed their hair, took a shower, you've benefited from the services of an environmental technician. And so when we look at this, some of the statistics we usually hear about, you know, there's like 1.2 million miles of water supply pipes underneath us. And, you know, we can see the pipes. Sometimes you see them being being put in. There's 155,000 public water systems in the United States. And a public water system is any water system that supplies either 15 service uh, ties into it or uh, delivers water to 25 people for 60 days or more in the year. That's a public water system. So there's 150, over 155,000 of those in the United States. There's about 700 to 800,000 miles of public sewer pipelines underneath us. So there's roughly about 2 million miles of pipeline underneath us. And there's 14,780 public wastewater treatment facilities in the country, not to mention that there's also private facilities with companies that are doing that. So and a lot of these pipelines are over 100 years old, some of them as much as 200 years old. And so every mile of water pipeline suffers a break every six years. So when we think about all the water that we produce, one out of seven gallons right now of our drinking water is lost to leaks in the system. 
And there's a big effort now to contain those leaks because we're spending a lot of money treating this water and then it's just going into the ground. Some of the leaks are spectacular. You see these big gushes of water coming out, but also a lot of the leaks are small and they're underground. And there's actually systems that are out there that you can listen for leaks and you can put it down so you can pinpoint where the leaks are. And so one of the things when we're, we're looking and you people are going to be the people that are going to be voting in the near future, if you're not voting right now, we're going to have to spend over a trillion dollars in the next 25 years just to maintain the systems that we have. Our grandparents put these things in and paid for them, but now they're coming time where these things have to be replaced. Because just think if you didn't do anything to your house for a hundred years, you know, it, it wouldn't be in very good shape. So, you know, some of the, a lot of these pipelines have to be replaced. Now, some of the statistics we don't hear about is that there's about currently about 117,000 water and wastewater treatment plant operators working in the country. And there's expected to be about a six to seven, uh, six percent or 7,000 job growth in the next 10 years. This was uh, relatively to some of the most recent thing that I was just looking at. They're actually saying that there's going to be a drop in jobs because of automation in the system. But that's deceiving because in the next few years, and it's what's going on right now, is we have to replace 33,000 workers now and in the coming years due to retirements. So there's going to be a lot of positions available. And 25 to 50 percent of the wastewater workers will be retiring in the next five years. And so when we look at this, our region, the Northeast, is going to actually be hit harder than other regions because of the water quality workforce is older. We've been, had some of the first uh, water treatment and wastewater treatment plants in the areas. And so the average age is over 50 in the United States, in the, the Northeast. And also there's an average experience of people retiring is about 24 to uh, 24 years of experience. So there's also going to be a, uh, a great loss of knowledge. And so what we will need to do is there's going to be a, this, a critical need to expand and update our wastewater and environmental programs at the community college level. Because one thing that happened was there was a lot of these uh, programs that went to the wayside when there was on the federal end, there wasn't much of a push for environmental, uh, kind of environmental careers. But it's, it's coming back now and people are, are looking to hire people in the water and wastewater industry. And so uh, in 2014, the Advanced Technology Environmental and, and Energy Center in Davenport, Iowa, they received money from the National uh, Science Foundation to conduct a series of water conversations around the country. And so it, the one in the, in the Northeast, we hosted it at Bristol Community College. So we had people from all over New England come to discuss what was the status. We hosted it with the New England Interstate Water Pollution Control Commission. And so what the status of, of that from these experts was that the industry leaders confirmed that there's a critical need for a pipeline of operators. And the need is likely to increase in the next five to 10 years. And, you know, when we're talking about operators, you're coming out, you know, say coming from uh, programs at the community college, and you're probably starting in the range of, I'd say, depending on what qualifications you have, 18 to 20 some dollars an hour to start, plus overtime, which is time and a half, you know, so, you know, you can make a very good wage uh, as a water and wastewater operators. Also, they determined that the demand for clean water is going to continue to grow in coming years. So we're going to need more uh, water. One of the things is, I, I don't know if people are aware, but in Dighton, we actually have a desalination plant, which takes water from the Taunton River and, and uh, go, puts it through... Uh, nano filtration and uh, reverse osmosis and it creates water for Brockton, the city of Brockton. And in Swansea, 
they have a desalination plant which takes water from from the Palmer River and provides about a million gallons a day to the Swansea residents because the wells aren't able to keep up with what they need. And so one of the things that they came with that new training programs would be needed and program curricula would be needed to be aligned with business and industry using performance based functions. So and it also needs for infrastructure when people talk about infrastructure what they're talking about is uh, with water, they're talking about pipelines, treatment plants, uh, looking at the uh, equipment and things. And another thing that is of concern is aquifer drawdown. An aquifer drawdown means that you're pumping water out of an aquifer. An aquifer is a uh, geological formation that's in the ground that can, also, can hold water, but also transmit water. So water can flow through it. And so what happens is when you stop pumping, the, the level in near the well drops. But when you stop pumping, it should go back to normal, to the level it was before. But what we're seeing, finding is that we're pumping so much water out, it's not coming back to the levels where they were. So that's what they're talking about with aquifer drawdown. And also the, they came up and saying we needed funding. And so one of the things, as I said, I've been providing training here at, at Wastewater, uh, at Bristol Community College for over, over 20 years. And in 2014, we established the concept of the Blue Center for Water Technologies. And I had a presidential, a Bristol Community College presidential fellowship where I came up with this idea to create it. And this is the logo for our Blue Center for Water Technologies. And so the mission of our Blue Center is preserve our water resources through education and community collaboration. And so during this fellowship, I also worked on developing a training program to address the needs that industry had. And so our project was called the New England Water Treatment Training, or NEWT. And we, sent, we submitted our proposal in October of 2015, and in the spring of 2016, we were awarded a $600,000 grant. This was the logo that I put together for the, uh, uh, for the grant. And some of the, the major goals of our, our grant was to create an advisory board made up of representatives from industry, academia, and regulatory agencies from all over New England. And we have that that board. We also conducted early on an industry-based, what's called a DACUM, which is developing a curriculum. So this was based on, we brought in people from all over New England to come up with what are the job, what's the job of a water operator and a wastewater operator? What do they need to know? What equipment do they need to learn how to work? And also what math, because math is an important thing, that's required and so what math skills do they need to know? And so we developed part of this was develop hybrid, hybrid courses which are online and face-to-face. -face. And so we developed these courses in drinking water and wastewater programs and we created two certificates, one for wastewater, which is now we're trying to move away from the term wastewater and turn it into clean water technology since it's, this water is being recycled in a lot of places and it's not waste. And then also we have a drinking water certificate program. And so we're trying to bring in, we uh, meet with our career centers and our veteran centers to bring in more people of that underrepresented students into this water and uh, wastewater careers. And so we also created a mechanism to get college credit if you already had state certifications in water and wastewater, because what you do is after you take your training, you have to take a state exam in order to get a license to work in the, uh, the treatment area. So our programs train you to work in there. So we put in, a, in place a way that you could get college credit for courses that are needed in preparation of stating, taking the state certification exam if you've already passed that certification exam. We also enhanced the laboratory capability. So this was the development of the Blue Center for Water Technologies. And we created a, uh, 
lending lab also. So that school, so if you're out there, you know, tell your teachers that time to know, uh, hopefully you are going to get back to a little bit more normal. But, and, and the, I know the Global Charter School has actually borrowed some of our equipment as part of this program. So, you know, that we have equipment that's available for people to borrow when we're not using it. And so what we created was a model hands-on drinking and wastewater training operation. This is the classroom area. Then these, you can look at another time, but this is all the possible things that we can do training on. And then I have a, uh, I built from scratch a, uh, a water treatment plant. So this does exactly what a water treatment plant would do, all the steps in a conventional water treatment plant. We also have an aquaculture system. And there's two, these are two, uh, as you can see right there, these are two 400 gallon tanks. I have goldfish in them right now. And what they're doing is, this is a wastewater treatment plant right here. So they're supplying waste and so that the, people can uh, learn how to do it. Then we have different types of pumps equipment, testing equipment, and also uh, flow meter equipment. And this is again, more pictures of the testing equipment. We also have, we donated a 275 gallon coral reef ecosystem, which is kind of the, uh, uh, the thing that you can see from the center from the outside. And then we also are developing internships. This is one of our students here, Mike Poitras, who is now, he's been to other parts of the country working, but now he's back here in Fall River and he's actually gonna be working with us on the grant. He came with us to Washington to do, uh, make some presentations because we take students down to Washington annually with the career. We also wanted to implement these programs in other community colleges throughout New England. And so we, we actually have uh, the Northern Maine Community College has uh, duplicated some of our stuff. And we have uh, other schools that are looking at uh, some of our curriculum. And we also conduct outreach to high schools. I bring high schools in to do programs at the college. We talk with employment agencies and recruitment strategies so we can encourage minorities, women, veterans, and other non-traditional students into the water industry. And the idea is to create a pool of qualified drinking water and wastewater operators so we can meet the growing need in the New England region. These two girls here are actually from Brazil and they came for our water program through a state department thing. Uh, she's from Rio here, Marina, and uh, she's from, uh, well, this was a few years ago, she's from Sao Paulo in Brazil. And this is again, another picture of Mike. And so, you know, that's my presentation. If we have time, if you have questions about the careers in the water industry, cause it's a, it's a big industry now. And there's, uh, you know, we're, we're looking for people. I just had uh, someone contact me this morning from Connecticut saying, if we have any students in our class looking for work, we have jobs and they're willing even to hire people that don't have their licenses yet. So it's something that's, uh, there. It's a career that's, you know, in demand right now. <laughs>